treat today. This session is going to be um, provided by Mizan Alkebulan Abaka, who is um, a tremendously special person uh, whom I have the privilege to know, and also um, a really great example of, of how um, school-based health centers and school health can be more than just clinical care for young people that really do many of the things that Dr. Jin Wright spoke about, for those of you who were able to hear him, and in terms of transformation and building pride and cultural wealth and agency and power in a really, really um, special way. So I do want to take a moment just to apologize for all the technical difficulties this morning. I know um, it was stressful and frustrating, and I hope that um, this session will not um, bring those same challenges. Um, so again, we're really glad you're here. Um, just in terms of housekeeping, Mizan's going to be reading the chat throughout and responding, you know, asking you questions and asking you to comment. So please feel free to populate the Q&A and the chat. And we'll also probably leave some time at the end for questions. Um, so again, thank you, welcome. I'm, we're so glad you're here and I'll turn it over to you, Mizan. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you, everyone. Really excited to be here with you all, um, this wonderful conversation. Um, I so wish, actually, that we were in the same room together, because this would definitely be a different experience that way. Um, but hopefully, technical challenges don't uh, interfere with your experience today, and just really looking forward to um, to building with you all and, and getting to know uh, kind of where we are uh, and having the opportunity to really reflect on race and think about how we can restore relationships at school-based health centers. Um, so thank you for joining uh, with me today. Again, my name is Mizan. I am uh, the co-creator of SpiritWorks organization based here in Oakland, California, uh, that I started with my husband and partner. Um, and we do a lot of work around inspiring intergenerational wellness and racial healing. We've done a lot of things over the years, including being a, a school-based health center supervisor with La Clinica for many years. I'm really helping to start and shape a lot of the work that's happened with school-based care here uh, in the Bay Area. And so excited to be able to offer and share a little bit of our thoughts around this work. A lot of what we do is really around um, creating experiences to transform lives, similar to what Dr. Jen Wright talked about, who's also one of my great mentors, um, Dr. G is what we call him, Baba is what I also call him, uh, you know, very connected to the development of healing centered engagement work. And so the work that we do is really, like I said, to create experiences to transform lives. Our work is around um, providing cultural events. Um, we do a lot of community convenings. Um, and professional consulting and trainings and workshops such as these to really help support um, changing the narrative of how it is that we live our lives and even do this work in a way that helps us ground down into our purpose, our mission, and our vision. Um, our work is definitely very creative. Um, it is courageous and definitely inspired by love. Um, so we're excited for you all to be with this journey today. Today, our flow is we'll take a minute to uh, ground in and kind of check in with each other and see who's here. And then we'll have an opportunity to reflect on race and think about the ecosystem of three eyes. Dr. Jen Wright shared a little bit of that this morning around the individual, interpersonal, and institutional, and we'll explore those a little bit more today. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity to restore our relationships by reflecting on our and exploring our own identities. Um, this, we were hoping to be able to do breakout groups, but I don't think that our um, technological capacity has the opportunity for that, but we will play with it and see um, if we can do this in a little different way. Um, and then we'll close out um, with a little gratitude um, to ground down uh, as we go on to the rest part of our day. Um, hopefully that sounds good with everybody. Um, we're looking forward to it. So in the chat box, if you could please share your name, where you're calling from, one word of how you're feeling and or uh, one expectation or hope for today's session. And I'll give you all just a few minutes to just put it in the chat. And I see it coming in. Yes, yes, yes. I'm actually working on two screens, y'all. So forgive me for looking here and here. Uh, so I want to make sure I can see everyone's chat. Good morning. I see 
Let's see, Jen is here. Thank you. I see Ashanti. Thank you, everyone. Yes, good morning. Hi, Naomi. Good morning. Erica is here. Laura, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Michelle from Oakland, thank you. Mm -hmm. Want to replenish. Thanks. Hi, Lamont. Hi, Christina. And I'm just taking a minute so we can read through these chats because in this way, um, one of the things that I really appreciate and know um, that one of the ways that we undo racism, uh, one of the ways that we are able to build a healing centered culture, one of the ways that we are able to honor our youth and really support each other's wellness is by acknowledging each other. And so we just take a moment, you know, if we were in the same space, it would look different, right? But here in this virtual world, we're going to take a little time to look at the chats from Calvin, to look at the chats from Erica. Thank you. And Alexis, I see you. Laura, thank you. Jackie, I see you. Feeling a little out of breath. I'm glad the Zumba was good this morning. I've missed that part, but hopefully it was well. I see you, Rebecca, Diana. Thank you, everyone. I see you all. So thank you all for being here. Appreciate the time. And thank you for grounding in with us. So as we proceed, let's just take a minute to just take a deep breath. It's a lot that happens before and after this very present moment. But if you can and you're available to you, and just put your feet on the ground. If that's available. Just see if you could just wiggle your toes just a little bit. Find yourself grounding into this very present moment. And I'll ask you to invite you to take a deep breath. And exhale fully. And as we ground in, feeling our feet on the floor, just take a moment to think about all those folks that have guided you, whose shoulders you stand on, whose path, who's laid the path and opened the path and the ways for you. Just think about what, what it is that you're grounded in right now and who has supported your process. And take a deep breath in and exhale fully. And as we take this minute to kind of ground in the one thing that I know that is really important, particularly today and during this time of year, is a time when our ancestors are really close to us. The time when we want to honor, you know, there's a legacy that has come from us. There's a legacy of people that have come before us that have been able to shape and guide who we are and how we've come to this space. And so we're just going to take a minute, and I forgot to grab my water. But we'll take a minute to just grab our water. So if you have water next to you, we're going to do this libation in a way that's kind of a participatory process, and I wish I could see you all. But I'm going to invite you to pour water into your own body as if it were the earth. Generally, we use water and pour water onto the earth, as you see here. And we say the names of those folks who have come before us. And we use the water as a symbol of our life force, remembering that all things are always connected. And so if Today, in a way to support our wellness and our health here, at the California School-Based Health Alliance Conference, we want to make sure that all those folks who are here serving our young people are taking care of themselves and being well for yourselves. So we're going to pour libation into you and into your life. So as we take a moment and take a breath, what we'll do is say the name of someone. You can put it in the chat. You can say it out loud. Just think about the name of someone that you want to call on and remember for their support of how you've got here. And then we'll take a drink and we'll take a drink of our water to nourish our bodies. 
and honor our ancestors at the same time. I'd like to start with honoring my grandmother, Deslin Advira Barnes, James Young, Ashe. And you can do the same, take a drink of water, nourish your body, remembering your ancestors. I'd like to honor my great grandmother, Rebecca Barnes, Ashe. And I'd also like to honor Javad Jahi, someone who died before their time, definitely a organizer and one who dedicated their lives towards the upliftment and the liberation of young people. Ashe. I'd like to honor the energy of Ida B. Wells, truth teller. Ashe. I'll just take a moment to just think about all those that you want to honor, all those that you want to think about. And if I could see you and if I could hear you, I would say it all together. But for all those that you are saying in your hearts and your minds, we we'll say three ashes together and take three drinks. Ashe. Ashe. Thank you all. And just to ground in, Ashe is a, a word, a Nigerian word, come from the Ifa tradition. And it is a way that we kind of put our energy into the words. And so when we say Ashe, it means we're agreeing, we're saying yes to remembering our ancestors. Yes, to remembering all these people who have been killed by the police, from George Floyd to Eric Garner, you know, to Brianna, all of those in between, Sandra. There are so many names on the screen who have lost their lives at the hands of the police. And at this moment, we're just gonna take a moment of silence to honor them. Thank you all. And we ground into this moment around reflecting on race and thinking about those who have been killed at the hands of the police because we recognize the legacy of racial violence is a question of power. And so when we reflect on race in this time, we, rem we all remember when last year that, you know, the world was on fire everybody was like yo we have had enough young people elders we have had enough and so the conversations about race and restoring relationships became a really real and important process to how it is that we think about what the new future is when we have an opportunity to reflect on these times and reflect on this energy that we're in it really helps to transform what it is that we have the capacity and possibilities to create we also know that schools are really fertile grounds to addressing this inequity and addressing and building resilience. You know, there's a legacy of, 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 of energy that has happened on school campuses that have been able to look at how we want to create justice. So the question that becomes, and what is race? What do, what, do, what do we mean by this? And why is it such a thing that becomes so charged that people lose their lives or systems or entire systems are created to protect or destroy. So we can think about race and kind of all of these kind of constructs here, right? We can think about race on a, a, in terms of sociology and how you're connected to other people. We can think about it in terms of culture, in terms of traditions and the experiences that you've had. We can think about along the lines of biology, if you want, or around politics. Right, around the power and the way that we use power. But the question really comes about how do you identify? And when you think about what, how do you identify, if you would just put it in the chat. Let's go ahead and you know share in the chat what it is and how it is that you identify. I see some things are coming in. How 
do you all identify in terms of race? Hmm. Thank you, Felipe. Human. Yep. And I see Ashanti as a black activist. Thank you. Latinx, queer, trans, mixed. Thank you. Yeah. Latina, Mexican immigrant, human, white, Yurok, white aspiring ally. Yeah, black as hell. I see you. Jewish female American, Chicana, Latina. Thank you. A lot of times we want to think about this conversation when we think about how we identify because it's really important. Like all of these other con constructs and things that we can think about, you know, really we think about race is really, is really a social construct, right? It really is a way that we think about um, how we are able to change and transform our reality. It's really about power and privilege. And so when you think about um, the groups of people or the identities that we have, we recognize that, you know, there are some people who have a little bit more privilege than others, right? And in general, white, male, heterosexual, able-bodied, wealthy folks are generally those folks who are characterized as, as of having more privilege in this world. And the opposite of privilege is oppression. But one of the things that's really interesting about this process is thinking about intersectionality, where thinking about how there's complex and cumulative ways that we are experiencing different forms of racism or sexism um, or any kind of discrimination or oppression, and these combine and they overlap in different ways and we experience them in very different ways. And so I'm gonna show you all this next slide. And it's a slide around looking at um, an access of intersectionality. And this access of intersectionality is shows us a number of different um, identities, both on the top line and on this bottom line. And the idea was, the idea for us to think about is just take a look at this lines that we experience. Some of us already shared that we are, you know, identify on one, one line or the other uh, in the chat box, which you already shared just take a look. And if we were able to think about those things that we identify with on this top green arrow or on the bottom, just notice. And just take a look and see and just kind of reflect on your own identity and see about how many of these you identify with. If we were in a Zoom world, I'd have you all annotate and we could just fill up this whole box to be able to see about where it is that this room and this space that we're in together and how you all identify and what that means for you. Now, one thing that I noticed about this process is that oftentimes we may identify with multiple things on multiple areas of this spectrum, right? For example, I identify as someone who's able-bodied, but I'm also someone who's experienced um, a disability. So I have experiences on both ends of this um, of the spectrum, right? Both in an area of privilege and also one who's experienced oppression because of my disabilities. We also might say that this the other component around um, you know where we are in our lives now and, and what we've had experienced in our lives, they may be different. When I was growing up, you know, we were rolling pennies uh, to get gas money for us to get to school, right? We used to, I don't know if y'all remember, but there was a time when, uh, you know, we would get food boxes from the food bank and the big blocks of cheese, which is like the strange nondescript kind of cheese. I don't know if y'all ever remember that, but it was uh, government cheese was a thing, right? And it wasn't quite cheddar. It wasn't quite like American cheese. It was something else nondescript, right? So it's an interesting thing. But nonetheless, as I grew up, I identified as someone who's working class and poor. Now I, I'm a homeowner. So now that for, for many folks who are unhoused in my community, that that makes me in, um, you know, kind of middle class, right? And so there's experiences that we might have that are on both ends of this power and both ends of the spectrum. And so just take a look and think about what it is, that, where it is that you might identify on this spectrum. 
And as we're thinking about this process, um, you know, there's um, there's things that we have to think about. A lot of times when people think about intersectionality, they think about it only in, in the way in which, in which we experience oppression. But I, I think that the expansion of this conversation around our experiences is that we experience both a privilege and oppression, right? And in different spaces, in different settings, in different realities, we all have a certain level of privilege. And even there's things that are not on here that makes us all extremely privileged. One, we have access to running water. Most of us have access to running water. We have choices of food, right? We have power that stays on. We don't have bombs dropped on our houses right now in this time, in this area that we're, most of us are living in, right? Those are experiences of privilege that we have. That when we think about how it is that we engage with other folks, and that's a way that we can also be able to honor and create connection with each other so that we have a little bit more empathy to how it is that we move. Does that make sense for folks? I wish I could see you all and see head nods, but it's all right. I'll continue. Please, if there are thoughts and you want to put them in the chat, please do so. So as we think about racism, when we're thinking about race in this process, it's really involving this level of pre prejudice and discrimination, right? And people also want, don't want to have, for a long time, they haven't wanted to talk about it. Right. Until 2020, people had conversations, heated conversations with people who like racism doesn't exist anymore. Obama's president. I'm like, really? OK. Right. Really? But there's so much more about this process. And now I'm so thankful that the world has decided that and the veil has kind of been peeled back that we're really looking at where does race come up? Where does racism exist? And where do we have this opportunity to shift and change, particularly for the young people that we share, that we serve in our school-based health centers? And racism really is about power. And when we think about power, I love to use this example. I don't know if you all know and remember this time in history, but this is a picture of Kwame Ture, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, also one of my mentors as well, um, now an ancestor. Um, but he was the one who coined the term Black power. And so we think about, you know, the Black Power movement for Black folks in America um, has been really an essential to kind of the, the shift and the transformation of our society. But I also want to think about, you know, this other definition that Dr. Wade Nobles, uh, a scholar here out of Oakland, says that power is the ability to define reality and to have other people respond to that definition as if it were their own. And so when you think about race or think about power, think about the ideas that we think about for other people, if someone else has given you an idea about who someone else is, they have defined your reality. And you are now responding to that reality as if it were your own. But the trick is, and the way to be able to shift all of these things is to bring that power back. Dr. Jenright talked about those three eyes earlier today in his conversation. And I'll just bring this back up because I really think that it's important to thinking about how it is that we transform racism and reflect on race on all of these different levels. One, thinking about it on an individual level. What is it that we've learned about who we are, about what we value, about who we are, how we can care for ourselves, about our, about our value, right? What is it that we've internalized about our own identity. What does it mean for us in terms of race? Right? What, what meaning have we assigned to that on an individual level? And when we think about those and we have time to reflect on those, it helps us to just kind of heal through that process from all of these social toxins that exist that have rained down on us. And then we get the opportunity to think about it on an interpersonal level. How do we treat other people? How, what is our connections with each other? How have we been able to build and grow with each other to really transform the world that we live in? And when we think about it, you know, does the way that we've internalized who we are and who other people are start to impact our relationships with each other? Absolutely. Do we walk down the street and see a group of black men and want to walk to the other side? Maybe, right? But that interpersonal kind of connection, or do we walk by and say, hi, how you doing, right? Do we greet each other? 
So all those ways that we share our interpersonal relationships with each other, even, you know, from the small ones that we have and, you know, kind of non-intimate spaces just in, in out in the world or in close relationships with people that we love, right? It all shapes all of those things. And then it starts to shape our values and our practices and our policies at an institutional level. What do we set up within our school-based health centers or within our schools or in our actions with young people that, that shares the value of who they are in terms of their race and their, their culture? What practices can we put into place that can help to uplift and generate more equity and more diversity and more inclusion into how it is that we really build with each other? And so these, these layers of these social toxicities are real. And as Dr. Jen Wright talked about, they rain down us on us, this fear and the shame and this that we've gotten from, from racism, from homophobia, from poverty, from colorism, from all of these social toxins that exist. It rains down on us and soaks into us. And so we now have the opportunity to, if we take time to really reflect on it, that these eyes become, you know, not just our layers of oppression, but they become our spaces for healing. And so we get the opportunity to heal on an individual level, on an interpersonal level, on an institution level, and even further on an ideological level. We start to really ground down upon what do we value? What is really important to us? And as we think about those, we start to transform our relationships. We start to transform our world and our policies and to really create these spaces for healing. And so, I'll just pause there before I go on and just see if there's any reflections um, on these on this point. Virtual head nod. Thank you, Jordan. Hi, Jordan. Yes. Are there any reflections? And I'll also say that if there are things that come up and questions that you have or comments that you want to share, please feel free to use the Q&A function um, as well as this chat box as well, too. And I know that there's like a 10 second delay uh, um, from when I speak to um, when you all are able to actually hear me. So. Uh, forgive me if I pause longer than it makes sense. Uh, it's not quite real time. The virtual life, yay. So this next part, uh, I don't think anything is coming in, but if those things do come into the chat, I will definitely um, try to make sure that I keep my eyes on it, uh, multitasking on multiple screens. But thank you for uh, understanding and rolling with me. All right. Let's uh, think about this next section. We are going to think about how do we restore our relationships? So as we're thinking about reflecting on race and restoring relationships, that is the essence of how we change and transform our communities. We come back and we're able to see each other heart to heart, eye to eye, and really build, right? And all of those things takes healing. It takes time for us to heal. And so what we think about for healing, um, and it's kind of a, a definition, a working definition, if you will, it's very simple and not even that good of a definition, but it is this, it is a process. <laughs> it is a process of becoming well and healthy, of finding your balance and your connection to being able to be well, right? And for each one of us, that's gonna look different. For each one of us, what makes us well and what feels good in our world is gonna look different. There's an elder of mine uh, who wakes up every morning and drinks a Coke and smokes a cigar. And for me, that would not do well in my body, but for them, that would work well. They were happy and they were like 92 years old, right? So, you know, for everybody's body, it's different. There's another elder that also said, it's not what you eat, it's what you think, right? And so when we're thinking about, you know, what is gonna be good in our body, or what is it that we need in our body to be healthy or well? That is our process. And each one of us have our own individual process. But what we also know is that it's not just an individual process because a lot of the things that we're healing from 
are not just things that in, impact the individual. As we talked about, these social toxicities are not, racism doesn't just infect individuals, right? It affects us all. And so as we're thinking about how we, what healing requires, it requires a few things, right? For us to step into this process. It requires a little bit of willingness, right? A little bit of honesty, accountability, and agency. That's that word that Dr. Jen Wright shared in part of the karma model earlier, right? The agency, the capacity for us to transform our conditions from one to the other. That's a part of our healing journey. That's a part about how it is that we're able to heal and transform and change when we take control over what it is that we have a capacity to control, right? That also takes a lot of self-reflection. It takes that capacity for us to look in the mirror. Like, who are we? What do we want? And what are we doing? Who, what are we standing for? What do we want to connect? How do we want to connect with someone, right? When did we show up in the way that we wanted to? And when did we not? And how can we be accountable to that process? It also takes a capacity for us to have a social and a political analysis. A lot of the things that Dr. Jen Wright shared earlier are really around, you know, looking at the world through this lens, right? And sometimes it takes us to use this lens to have an analysis around some of the conditions that we are experiencing are because of the experiences of power. And it really comes down to capitalism or to white supremacy. And what does that mean? And how do we have, how to undo those things? And then how do we able to use our culture to be able to transform those, right? And I'm sure that if we were in the same space, healing would require many more things. I would love to hear what y'all think about what uh, healing requires. If you wanna put them in the chat, we will keep going, right? We'll just keep adding to this list. This is never by no means an exhaustive list, but just some things to think about for how it is that we step to the next space. So I'll just pause for a second take a look at the chat and see if there are things that you want to add to this list. I see growth, understanding and support. Yeah, absolutely. Courage. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lamont. Yeah. Capacity to bring all of yourself into the room. Yes, Jen, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it takes heart. It sure does. It takes, um, there's this wonderful word uh, that I'll share with you all called uh, vulnerageousness. My dear friend, uh, Miss T, it's a mixture of her, it's her word that she coined. It's a mixture of vulnerable and courageous, right? It's called vulnerageous and it takes a little bit of that. And yes, I think that healing also requires time and space. We're always on the go, this franticness, yes. Javier, thank you for the pressure is just to make space and time for us to heal. Yeah. Capitalism requires us to be in frenzy, right? But we able we are able to create some space, some spaciousness to find the flow as opposed to that frenzy. Absolutely. Mariela says that I believe that racism is something that is not spoken out loud in the Latino community. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. This does look very different in different spaces. Yeah. Thank you. But even, even being able to have those conversations, you know, when they think about, you know, particularly around, you know, color consciousness and, and, and Latinx communities, that's a really big thing, right? So just thinking about how we use that. I see you, Jordan, about healing requires authenticity, but also compassion. Yeah. Takes time, letting go, forgiveness. Absolutely. Community support. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Forgiveness is real. Forgiveness for ourselves as well as for others. Right? That's really a big process. So thank you. Thank you for sharing those in the, in the chat. When we think about racial healing, we think about it being a process of transformation that can move us from isolation to connection, from height to love, from conflict to harmony, from competition to collaboration, from othering to belonging, from fear to curiosity, from criminalization to justice, from dishonesty to truth, from harm to restoration, from discrimination to equity, and finally, from trauma to healing. And how we do that and how we move that transformation 
is creating belonging. And belonging is that process that kind of undoes the othering, that undoes the way of us seeing each other like we're some like we're different. When we asked the question earlier about how do we identify, and I love that the first answer was human. Right? As we see each other as human beings, as we see the young people who come in as human beings, then it helps to be, begin making more meaningful connections to each other. Right? And when we are connected to each other, it builds our sense of purpose, it builds our identity, and it really allows for the capacity for us to really share and build vulnera vulnerability with each other. It takes a place of listening. So it does be, need to be more than just the interpersonal conversations that we have with each other, but it's also a question and a process around how it is that we institutionalize this. How do we create belonging and connection on a Zoom screen, right? How do we take belonging and connection uh, in virtual office visits or in a dental exam or, um, you know, when you're doing, getting a, uh, you know, a, a, a test done at school? Like there's all different kinds of way that you can create belonging, connect connection. And one of those kind of processes is this, how we create belonging is through inquiry, reflection, and action. And we can kind of break those down a little bit. When we think about inquiry, it's like really a self inquiry, right? Or an inquiry of each other, just curiosity, meeting with curiosity, not in a way that makes other folks feel, um, as an oddity, but in a way that moves us towards wanting to build understanding of each other, right? And we create belonging by having opportunities to reflect on that, by writing, by observing, by seeing each other. And then, and almost most importantly, it takes us by taking some action, right? When we think about the action that we wanna take it's an action that helps us to not just be, um, you know, continuing on the status quo, but an action that helps us to really shift and transform the conditions that people are living in, to help us build and bring about um, the conditions of justice that we want to see. It takes action in order to do that. We just don't want to be not racist. We actually want to be anti-racist, right? We want to really be able to shift it from being in a space that we're not just turning the other cheek in a process that looks the other way when, when harm is done, but we're actually there to really support and acknowledge and see each other and see where we can be able to create the action that will help to bring the healing in that process. Does that make sense, folks? Oh, I wish I could see you all. If there's any thoughts in the chat, please bring them up. Yes, belonging must be institutionalized. Yeah, thank you, Jasmine, thank you. Thank you all, I see some comments coming in, yeah. Thank you. So this is the opportunity um, Oh, yes, I see that, Lamont, about not being colorblind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like that's a that's a thing. Um, and that, as you as you raised it, I would just um, just share that when folks be like, I don't really see race, I just see humans. I think that that is, um, I must say, and forgive me if this is your thought process, but we have to go a little deeper than that process. Right? You have to be able to see other people for who they are. You have to see their identities, their full selves, their elements of their culture, their experiences, their legacies, their ancestors. You have to see them because that's how you create connection. If you don't see them, if you don't see their color or their experience and you don't see their stories, then we don't actually see each other. You see an assumption of who each other are. And so when we break down the assumptions, that's actually the way that we create belonging when you come to actually really see each other and actually really acknowledge who each other are, that's the process. And it's actually this component too, the next that we were thinking about is about why do we tell our story? Right? We each have a story to tell. We each have a story that, that is ours to be able to hold and ours to be able to think about and ours to be able to share, right? 
And when we tell our stories, we begin to humanize ourselves and humanize each other. We can need to connect with each other and to learn about who we are. We'll be able to make things stick. We can share information or experiences that can really help to inform the next path, the next way that someone might do things. And so this is going to be a little tricky part. Ideally, we were going to be able to do uh, breakout groups, but I'm going to challenge y'all to do something uh, on this Zoom reality and see how it will work. I'm going to ask you all to find um, three objects. You can look around you, you can make them, but just think about three objects around you that represent you as a child, that represent you now, and represent you in the future. And this experience that we're going to go through is kind of a little bit of like, how do we play with this reality about creating belonging and creating connection to reflect on race and restore relationships? And so it's a little thing that we're going to see about how it works with our technology. But uh, if you all could just see about just taking a moment to go and find three, um, three objects, three objects. And I will give you uh, three minutes to go and find them. You can make them, you can find them, you can create them wherever you might be, if you're in your car or at the office or at home, um, at the school-based health center, three objects. And as we find those three objects, we are going to see about how we <laughs> do this. Initially, again, like I said, we were going to break out into groups and have conversation. Um, but we're going to play with technology a little bit and activate our chat. So I'll give you all about two more minutes to go and find and make your object. And I actually, forgive me, I was going to play a song while you all did that, and I forgot to cue it up. So I will just let the silence be, knowing that silence is actually okay for our minds to just be in a little bit of stillness for the next two minutes as we find our objects. And about one more minute or so. And as we begin to come back with your objects, we're going to try this in a way called Chatterfall. So what that means is that you are going to, if you can, describe in the chat what you chose and why you chose it, what represents you as a child you now and you in the future. These might be longer chats, 
So we're going to make it kind of like Chatterfall. Again, if we were in the same space together, uh, this would be much nicer to do. Uh, but we're going to play with what technology has so that we can still build this connection with each other by thinking about these objects and how it is that we tell our stories and how we can tell our stories through these objects. I see some folks are coming in already. Lamont says he has a son, a picture of his son's drawing of me as you as a child. Yes. The mask represents my now as I struggle with the issue of getting vaccinated or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lamont. Yeah. And number three, you in the future. It's your coffee cup representing the business I will be running in the future. Nice. Thank you, Lamont. And Erica says, I have a bush of roses. Yeah. Thank you. And Erica, does that bush of roses represent you as a child? You now or you in the future? Stephanie says, they have a tiger face pencil topper representing my childhood, a happy, playful, and carefree. Thank you. I can, I can see that in my mind, yes. Um, Javier is as a child, he has a ruler, feeling of not measuring up. And now uh, my hand knit sweater, handmade life, making life from scratch. And the future, the shoes, muddy from the labor of joy and protection of what will carry me forward. Uh, it will be messy sometimes. Mm, see that, Javier, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Sabrina adds a picture of my daughter with a soccer ball. I used to play soccer in high school. A coffee cup, I love coffee, and a cap and gown to hope to graduate from Stan State. Thank you, Sabrina. Yes, yes. Ah, I see you, Erica. So the bud is you as a child in your bush of roses. I see it. Yeah. I see Nancy has um, the child clouds curious and open and hopeful and now the mountain strong foundation and growing and the future is the roots long lasting strength to others mm, thank you nancy naomi a book my favorite activity as a child number two a sweater i knit for my granddaughter caring and stress relief in one yes and love to your grandbabies as well uh a yoga mat to keep myself healthy into the future. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Laura says, a child as a piece of my art from my father made recently to remind me of his spirit as he raised me. Thank you. Now, photos of me as a mother and the future sitting in a room that I attempt to keep organized, calm and restorative. It's aspirational. I feel you. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Adrian, a chocolate bar reminds me of all that sweet moments I've had. Mm -hmm. Business cell phone reps how I'm working hard in the moment and a pineapple hat to show how I will retire and rest in the future. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, those days does a bowl of candy representing my innocence and bliss, a laptop which is where I spend my days learning in the present and a family photo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maintaining healthy relationships and building new ones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gabriella, a little house that I bought from Mexico. Mm -hmm. The present with a heart and a butterfly that represents my current transformation. Yeah, the butterflies do that, yeah. And for future, the wooden heart with wings. No limits of where I can go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You all see these in the chat. Take a moment to just look through the chat, y'all. Jakara's note, notes that are here, Julie's that are here. And Erica is sharing more. And Stephanie, your stethoscope. <laughs> Present role as a school nurse. Yeah, a pair of reading glasses. Yep. Reading some good books. Thank you. Mm hmm. I see your thought, Erica, around the roses. Thank you. And Jordan. Yay, I see your menorah. Mm -hmm. And the shekere. And the little Buddha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Michelle is here. I wish I could see all of what you have. I don't think that, um, Tracy, forgive me if uh, I'm asking this, and, but there's no way that we can see them, right? It's just in the chat, right? Yeah, unfortunately, sorry. All right. That's all right. I think I asked you that already, but it was <laughs> I think asking again, like almost wishful thinking. If I spoke it yeah. into a it might happen. <laughs> you can transform the technology with your strong mm -hmm. wishes. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And Ashante wrote the baby dolls, my Bible, and my MacBook. Yeah, thank you. So when you think about these, all of these objects, right, you think about your identity. And hopefully in this process, I might actually would love to ask, and what was it like for y'all to think about and grab these objects for those who were able to share? What was that like for you to think about your identity in these three different ways? You can just put that in the chat as well. particularly thinking about, you know, the young people that we serve. How many times do we get to think about who we were as young people? And as we go through this process and thinking about, you know, all the ways that we're able to share. Yeah, I see Erica says, I realize how little I have from my childhood in my home as an adult. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes we, you know, the moving and changing and things going around, yeah, we all, things can move from, from one place to the other. I understand, Erica, for sure. Gabriella said, brought back lots of memories and grateful feelings. Nancy is happy to know I'm connected to our natural world. Yeah, thank you. Stephanie, it was very refreshing to see what everyone wrote. It is a description of who they are and what they value. Yeah. Thank you. So this process, when you're thinking about the objects, it's kind of almost a trick on the mind a little bit. It's a play with the mind, should I say, not a trick. It's a play with the mind. Oftentimes when we think about when somebody asks you, who are you? And you might give them your title, your role, uh, what you do, you know, who you serve, you know, who you're related to or connected to. When we think about objects, and things outside of ourselves, we get to give them meaning, right? They can represent anything that we want. You as a child, you now, you in the future. From a rose bush to a, a computer to a phone or a cup, whatever it might have been, these were just objects that you decided to make meaning with. Right? You decided to use your culture, your experience, your identity to be able to make meaning to this process. And so that is a part of the how it is that we are able to think about reflecting on race and restoring relationships. It's thinking about the meaning that we make. Thinking about the meanings that we make of objects, of experiences, you know, of lessons that we've learned. And so all of those things help to inform how it is that we move into the future and move with our young people. Yeah. I see Lamont says it's important to honor who we are and who we were, excuse me, and will be, especially when working with young people. Absolutely. Yeah. And I see your comment, Adrian. Forgive me if I'm saying that incorrectly. Uh, it was interesting to try to find objects in the office to, that can rep me. Yeah. Yeah. It's all kinds of things, right? When we think about our work with young people, you know, it's the meaning that we make and the impact that we make that has a difference. And just to bring in, you know, one another one of our ancestors in this process, you know, this quote that I love dearly, you know, from dear Maya Angelou, I've learned that people will forget what you've said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And when we think about creating belonging at school-based health centers or how we support young people, and really um, reflecting on our relationships to restore a space in a school-based health center that really does see them and honor them. It's really not the things we say necessarily or the things we do, but it's how those things land on folks and the feelings that they create and the emotional connection that, like, that lingers, for better or for worse, right? That's the kind of a definition of trauma, right? When the experience of an, of an event that has a lingering impact on you, right? 
That's that experience. So when we want to create belonging at a school based health center, what do we need for that? We can think about trust and transparency. We can think about cultural authenticity and acknowledgement. What do you do at your school based health center that helps to acknowledge the cultural legacies of the young people that you serve? How do you show that? How do you see that? How do you acknowledge who they are? Right? And how do you be accountable to them? Accountability and how do you help them be accountable? Right? And it kind of goes both ways. And I always love to add, and this is, you know, tips my hat off to Mama Nedja Jenright. Um, she thinks about accountability and grace together, always together. Because sometimes when we want to hold a people accountable to other things, we don't always recognize and, and give people grace that we're human, right? And we make mistakes. And in that gracefulness, we're able to grow. In that gracefulness of acknowledging our mistakes, be able to move forward and just move it forward, right? To the next, to transform our relationships, right? Dr. Jen Wright spoke earlier about the need for um, shifting our relationships from being transactional to transformative and the transactional thinking about like what do you do for young people you can help them with their you know std screening or you can help them with all those things but if you wanted to make it transformative you know dig down a little bit into who they are and what they want and what they value and help them help them grow and let them help you grow right it takes a two-way process and it also takes a little bit of around courageous conversations right there's conversations you might not want to have. You might not want to be, you know, but but having a little bit of courageousness in that process um, and using your um, experience and power and privilege in a way that helps to bring people in and not exclude them is part of how we have those courageous conversations as well. Right? And then finally, the last two that are super important and even growing from the conversation around the karma model earlier that Dr. Jen Wright shared is encouraging agency and justice, encouraging the capacity for us to transform our conditions, the agency that we have on an individual level, as a collective level and an institutional level to transform our way and imagining a new way. One of the things that we think about a lot for people who have experienced oppression is that the capacity for us to imagine is kind of the thing that gets lost first. But it is that very capacity to imagine and to hope and to dream of something new that is the way that we were able to transform conditions. My ancestors in Jamaica were um, it, in sugar plantations, right? And there was, uh, and even my grandmother, uh, you know, worked really hard, right? Really, really hard. And she decided, you know, when she had three children, that she was going to move to England. She imagined a new way so that she didn't have to, she still worked hard, but she didn't have to work in such harsh conditions as she was, right? And so her capacity to imagine a new way is actually how I'm here, right? We, there's a beautiful quote that I love is that we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. And when you think about, you know, what it is that our ancestors hoped for, what did they imagine for? What did they want for us to be able to create in this new world? You know, that is that is the way that we help to undo this process as well, too. In creating safety and trust is that way that we create belonging in school-based health centers. And so as we begin to close out, I would love to hear a little bit more from you all around what's your collective genius, you know, that we for us to feel safe and heard and respected within our institutions within our school-based health centers. What else can we do, you know, for us to be able to build with each other and share the light that each one of us have? Go ahead and put it in the, in the chat. You know, any thoughts that you have around what more can be done to help build, you know, some connection with each other at school-based health centers? And I know there's a delay, so I'll give you out just a second. Nancy, I see your comment. I'm so thankful for my ancestors. Indeed. Yeah. 
And Gabriella says, create some space for school staff to have these conversations. Absolutely. Yep. That is critical. Yep. Exploring what youth values is highly helpful to build a connection. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so much more, right? There's so much more about even just thinking about it. If we put that in our mind, how can we help young people feel safe, heard, and respected in our space? Even just shifting the thought process about how do we think about this, right? Then that's a way that we're able to even just start to manifest something new. I see Jen says, um, as white folks in leadership roles, we have to acknowledge in every space that we as white folks are also having a racialized experience, creating spaces for BIPOC folks to come in um, with all of their identities. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for acknowledging that component. You know, when we th think about race and we think about identities, it's not just people of color that have race and identities, right? Everyone does. Everyone has a culture. Everyone has an identity. And how do we use those identities and how do we let those identities shine to the best part of our experiences, right? So thank you. Yes, I see Claudia says, um, creating healthy relationships in an inviting environment. Mm -hmm. Encouraging compassion, tolerance, and genuineness, says Maria. Uh, sorry, Maria, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's so much more, indeed. And as we begin to close out, I want you all to just came, take this thought and this list with you. Take this experience around even just sharing a little bit, even through a virtual way about, you know, who you are and reflecting on these conversations around our race so that we can restore the relationships that we have. Take this back to your school-based health centers. Take the conversation there. Right. And for those of you, I just wanted to share another opportunities um, to continue to build. We're actually um, offering a free uh, two day healing retreat uh, Wednesday and Thursday. I know that that's also part of the time that we are doing this um, conference. So please uh, prioritize what you need um, most definitely. Um, but we're also involved in supporting some work around um, the reparations resolution in Oakland Unified School District. So if folks are um, interested in getting more information ar around that work and how we engage in having conversations with young people and families about the impact of race, the impact that that's had on their education and their experiences as they grow and thrive, please reach out to us as well. Um, you can see more information about that at ousd.org slash reparations um, as well. Um, and then I will just share our contact information before we close out with our gratitude moment. Um, I'm definitely thankful to be able to have these conversations and know that more is theirs to come, right? The work that we do at SpiritWorks is this, is inspiring conversations around race so that we can build the connections with each other and really see each other in deep ways. We're happy to be able to support you all if you need further support that way with your young people, with your staff, with your schools. Um, we're definitely working with Oakland Unified School District on their anti-racist education processes as well. Um, so some of you may see us at your school sites um, for those who are here in Oakland, um, but we also can do work um, nationally and, and even we've done work internationally as well. Um, so definitely happy to connect with y'all. These are our, our links and our emails. Um, please check our website is probably the best way um, to kind of see what's latest for us. Um, and as we close out in these next few minutes, just give you a moment to think about one thing that you are thankful for. As we take a pause to just let all of this just soak in. I invite you to take another nice deep breath in. And as we pause and breathe and notice all that we're thankful for, just let that gratitude settle into our bodies and our minds in this very present moment. 
thankful for the young people who have guided us to this moment. Thankful for the capacity to see and love and listen and grow. Thankful to be able to be in virtual space with you all. And I see the chats are coming in. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Lamont. Honored to be in space with you all very much indeed. Thank you, Jen. Yes, yes. Thank you, Michelle. And this time and space that we have to be able to reflect on our race, reflect on our relationships, and reflect on even in this moment around what we are thankful for and who has guided to us to be in this moment. We started this space thinking about our ancestors. And so there's so many people, people that have taught us, even if they're still with us today, teachers that we honor and love and respect. Let's take a moment to just think about all of them and just soak them all in. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for this time and all this gratitude that is here. And actually, um, one of the things that I am going to share with you all is the gift of time. We are technically supposed to go to uh, 12 o'clock, um, but uh, I am going to give you all the gift of seven minutes to carry on where uh, we will close out this session in this moment. And again, super grateful for all of you, super grateful for this time and keep spreading this light on these young people, y'all. We are changing this world one step at a time and y'all, we are doing this. So thank you, thank you, thank you for the time and for the energy. Please connect and reach out. I'll pass it back to Tracy. Thank you so much, Mizan. I consider you definitely one of my teachers and I'm sure others mm -hmm. hear you as well. And I know, um, for many of us after a frenzied morning, your common grounded power and um, speaking truth with power, not just to power, um, mm -hmm. was what I needed personally. I'm sure others are feeling that way. So thank you, thank you all for coming to Mizan's um, workshop. We appreciate you all. I'm just going to put a link in the chat for today's evaluation, which I hope you will all complete. Um, I think it worked. Um, we really appreciate you uh, evaluating our workshops so we can um, improve on them in future um, conferences. And I think with that, we'll close. Thank you all. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Blessings, everyone.